Hey everyone, welcome to Mythology Explained. In today's video, we are going to discuss the Spear of Destiny, the spear that pierced Jesus after he died on the cross. Also called the Holy Spear, the Lance of Longinus, and the Holy Lance. We are going to begin by spending a little time on the spear's current location. Then moving on to Hitler, who, at the very least, has become closely associated with it in pop culture. Then moving on to the practice of crucifixion, and finally, wrapping up the video with the death of Jesus and the significance of both water and blood pouring forth from Jesus' chest after he was stabbed. Let's get into it. First and foremost, it's important to note that the Spear of Destiny was just a regular spear before it pierced the side of Jesus Christ. It was the blood of Jesus that made it special. The true whereabouts of the Spear of Destiny are unknown and remain a mystery. While there are many legends and stories about the Spear and its ownership, there is no definitive evidence to suggest that anyone currently possesses it or knows where it is. Over the years, many alleged holy lances have been discovered, but none of them have been authenticated or substantiated as the true spear that pierced Jesus. Some of these lances are believed to be medieval forgeries, while others are believed to be genuine relics but lack the historical provenance to conclusively corroborate them to be the spear onto which the blood of Jesus poured. Some have suggested that the true Spear of Destiny may have been lost or destroyed centuries ago. Others believe that it may still exist, perhaps surreptitiously stashed away in a secret location by an ancient steward of bygone centuries, perhaps held by a private collector or organization that hasn't been forthcoming about the possession. Though the Holy Lance is lost to history, its story has grown with time and is today a well-known occult artifact. Many rulers, tyrants, and conquerors, all of whom made their mark on history for good or evil, are associated with it. So much so that a sort of post-biblical mythology has developed around it. Trevor Ravenscroft, who lived from 1921 to 1989, was an English author and mystic who is best known for his book the Spear of Destiny, the occult power behind the spear which pierced the side of Christ. Ravenscroft claimed that the spear had been possessed by several historical figures, including Charlemagne, Otto III, Saladin, and Napoleon Bonaparte, and that it played a central role in shaping the destiny of the world. He argued that the spear was a symbol of divine power and that its influence extended far beyond the realm of politics and warfare. While Ravenscroft's book was controversial, and its claims were almost entirely disputed, it became a cult classic and has been influential in popular culture, particularly in the realm of conspiracy theories and alternative history. Ravenscroft also had this to say about Adolf Hitler. Hitler believed that the Spear of Destiny was a talisman of power which gave its possessor the control of the destiny of the world. His theory was that this control had, in the course of history, passed through a number of nations and rulers, but that it had finally come to rest in the hands of the last German Emperor, Wilhelm II, who had been in possession of the Spear of Destiny until his abdication in 1918. This is an interesting passage because Hitler's fascination with the Spear of Destiny is documented in a multitude of other sources, many of them far more reputable than Ravenscroft's dubious ramblings. Hitler's fascination with the Spear, if, indeed, he truly was at all, seems to have been for reasons more mundane and prosaic than unleashing and harnessing holy power to dominate the world. Hitler was keenly aware of the power of narrative, this evidenced by his pathologization of Jewish people, creating a common enemy to bind Germany together and galvanize it. In this same vein, it has been said that Hitler was generally interested in ancient relics and artifacts, recognizing their symbolic power, which he believed would further German nationalism and bolster the burgeoning German Empire with legitimacy and prestige. On the other hand, there's plenty of information floating around out there, much of it of questionable veracity, such as Ravenscroft's book, that supports a more apocalyptic outlook, 
which is that Hitler believed the spear had mystical powers that could help him in his quest for world domination. This predicated on the belief that whoever possessed the spear would have the power to conquer the world. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence, this one firsthand, is a passage from Hitler's book Mein Kampf, in which he describes his fascination with the spear. In the book he writes, In my Vienna days, I read a book by the Vienna author Jörg Lanz von Liebenfelds, which really impressed me. Its contents were a kind of prehistory of the world, which the author claimed could be deciphered from the study of the lance. It was a unique idea, and it made a deep impression on me. In addition to Mein Kampf, there are numerous other accounts that suggest Hitler was interested in the spear. For example, the memoirs of Albert Speer, Hitler's chief architect and later his minister of armaments, describe how Hitler became increasingly preoccupied with the spear as the war progressed. Speer wrote that Hitler believed that possession of the spear would give him the power to win the war, and that he became more and more obsessed with finding it. We're now going to move on to the torturous practice of crucifixion and the death of Jesus, which will take us to the beginning of the Spear of Destiny's long and storied history. Information about crucifixion, though ghastly and gruesome, was surprisingly important to putting this video together, as it explains why a spear was used to pierce the side of Jesus. Crucifixion was a brutal form of execution. The death of Jesus made it synonymous with capital punishment in the Roman Empire, but it was by no means exclusive to the Romans, having a long and grisly history, notably used by the Persians, Carthaginians, and the ancient Greeks as well. At a glance, it's plain to see that crucifixion is one of the worst ways a person can leave this world, but really, it's far more diabolical even than what's revealed on the sadistic surface. The process of crucifixion involves several steps, each of which was designed to prolong the victim's suffering. The first step was the preparation of the cross, which typically involved the victim carrying the crossbeam, patibulum, to the site of the execution. Once the victim arrived at the execution site, they would be stripped of their clothing and laid on the ground with their arms outstretched. The arms were then nailed or tied to the patibulum, and the victim was raised into an upright position. Next, the victim's feet were either nailed or tied to the vertical post of the cross. This forced the victim to support their weight on their arms and legs, which caused immense pain and made breathing difficult. The weight of the victim's body would eventually cause their chest to expand, making it even harder to breathe. Death by crucifixion could last anywhere from several hours to several days, depending on the health and strength of the victim and suffering was so drawn out that people typically died of exposure or asphyxiation, either succumbing to the elements, naked and nailed as they were, or suffocating, the weight of the body pulling down on the chest making it almost impossible to breathe. Sometimes, crucifixion was accompanied by the practice of crurifragium, which involved the shattering of a person's legs with a bludgeoning weapon, usually a heavy mallet. The term crurifragium is derived from the Latin words cruce, which means leg, and frangere, which means to break. Crurifragium was used on crucified people for a couple of reasons. First, it created a brutal spectacle that served to further deter people from dissenting or committing crimes, the crowd bearing witness to what awaited insurgents and transgressors. Second, it made people die more quickly. People would periodically use their legs, pinned though they were, to support themselves and catch their breath. This was impossible with shattered legs, so death by asphyxiation was brought about much sooner. Even on its own, crurifragium was considered a particularly brutal punishment because it not only caused excruciating pain, but also rendered the person permanently disabled. In some cases, the punishment was used as a form of execution, as the person would not be able to walk or escape and would eventually die from their injuries. According to the Gospel of John, when Jesus was crucified, there were two criminals also crucified nearby, one on either side of him. As the Sabbath day was approaching, the Jewish leaders asked Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea under whom the crucifixion happened, to have the legs of the three men broken so that their deaths would be expedited and their bodies could be taken down and not left hanging during the Sabbath which began at sunset on Friday and continued until nightfall on Saturday. 
The deaths of both criminals crucified alongside Jesus were hastened by the breaking of their legs. But the same was not needed for Jesus, who was already dead. A Roman soldier named Longinus in extra-biblical tradition, hence the name Spear of Longinus, made sure of this by piercing Jesus' side with his spear. Jesus' side being pierced by a spear is packed with messianic meaning. Dying before his legs were broken is viewed as a fulfillment of prophecy. In the book of Psalms, it says that the Messiah, Jesus in Christianity, would not have his bones broken. This is often seen as being fulfilled during the crucifixion of Jesus, who died before having his legs smashed to hasten his death. Psalms 34.20 reads, He protects all his bones, not one of them shall be broken. When Jesus was pierced by the spear, both blood and water flowed from the wound. This event is significant to Christians because it was also seen as a fulfillment of prophecy and a symbol of salvation. In Zechariah 12.10, it says, And I will pour out onto the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that, when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him, as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him, as one weeps over a firstborn. This verse is interpreted by Christians as referring to the piercing of Jesus during his crucifixion. The house of David refers to the lineage of Jesus, who was descended from King David, while the inhabitants of Jerusalem refer to the Jewish people who lived in Jerusalem during the time of Jesus. The prophecy continues in Zechariah 13.1, where it says, On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. This verse is seen as referring to the fountain of cleansing water that would flow after the Messiah is pierced. The significance of both water and blood flowing from Jesus' wound has been interpreted in several ways by theologians and biblical scholars. Some have suggested that the water and blood were symbols of the sacraments of baptism and Eucharist. Others have suggested that the water and blood were evidence of Jesus' humanity and divinity, the blood seen as a symbol of his humanity, and the water seen as a symbol of his divinity, which has the power to purify and cleanse the world. And that's it for this video. If you enjoy the content, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.